Hello everyone, my name is Deepak Kaul and today uh, I'm going to be talking about four testing lessons from USA Airways Flight 1549 that landed in Hudson, it's very famous. Uh, it had a movie made on it called Sunny. So I, I actually read the National Transportation Safety Board report and uh, while reading that I, I thought maybe there are a lot of uh, lessons not testing in particular, but overall leadership lessons as well. Uh, so I tried to draw parallels with how, as a tester, we can learn from that incident and probably make uh, make some habits in our daily lives. So I really appreciate you all taking time to uh, uh, attend this session here in DevConf, and I I hope I can make your time worthwhile. So here we go. So a little bit about me. My name is Deepak Kaul. Uh, I'm a QE manager in Red Hat. I'm based out of uh, Red Hat's Pune office in India. And it has been uh, more than nine years in Red Hat. And before that, uh, I did uh, around five years in a company called PTC, which is again, uh, Boston Seaport based. Uh, all right. Moving on. Okay, just just take three seconds to read it. This is uh, this is quoted from that National Transportation Safety Board report, which I was mentioning earlier. So just the shuddering sound. It it actually gives me shudders just thinking about it. So what it tells us, see, modern jet engines are uh, certified to handle birds, some kind of birds, right? Uh, at, at the point when this incident happened, uh, the jet engines, the commercial jet engines at least were certified to test multiple bird hits with the bird size of uh, 2.5 pounds max, or maybe some large birds around four pounds but a single bird, right? So what they'll do on in those uh, engine factories is that they will throw dead birds uh, at a running engine to check that the engine does not lose power or the thrust uh, up to 70% limit um, when it is hit by those birds. But, uh, during this this particular incident, the flock of birds that hit uh, flight 1549 was migratory Canadian geese, and uh, they they can be big, right? They they're not just ordinary birds. I mean, no bird is ordinary, right? But still, uh, they are not smaller birds, right? They are big. The male Canadian geese uh, can grow up to. 8.5 to 9 pounds in size. Plus, uh, it was a big flock that hit uh, flight 1549. So, what they the damage they did was that they not only hit the uh, the turbine blades of the both the engines, but they also hit the central core. And and then uh, the flight had to. Uh, uh, flight had to land in Hudson, as you all know. Uh, nobody, nobody. Uh, there were no casualties. Some people got minor injuries, according to that report. Uh, and it was the good things were that uh, both the pilots, right, the captain and the co-pilot, they they did tremendous job, as we all know, Captain Sully and Captain Skiles. Uh, the crew, uh, the flight attendants, and everyone uh, in the crew, they also did a great job of. E evacuating passengers on time because the uh, the air temperature was very cold. The water temperature was very cold. It was January in in New York that time, and uh, the the crew on the ground, the safety crew on the ground, also did uh, a good job. You know, uh, uh, coming to the incident site and uh, in ferrying passengers out of of the flight to the safe zones. A warmer uh, safe suits. 
but again birds uh, they they can be terrible like uh, especially canadian geese you, you can see here right so how does how does it draw parallels to testing so not not very long ago uh, we were testing the uh, pilot attachment system and for the support side of it and while doing that uh, we also had to do some kind of benchmarking and performance testing like what is the biggest file size that we that a customer can attach to a support page right 100 gb probably maybe 200 because the person who is building the system does not know the business and one day i remember i was sitting with one of the managers in the support delivery and they told me that uh, one of the telco customers had an attachment on a case very recently that was 800 gb and then that changed my whole whole world view of attachment size the lesson lesson as tester that we learn from this incident uh, especially is that you know in the pursuit of releasing software on time uh, we should not be cutting corners on talking to actual users and if possible uh, let's say talking to users is not possible as was the case with me at least talk to people who are doing customer facing work right they they are probably the your best chance of getting the first hand knowledge about how that piece of software is going to be used so in this case uh, uh, a canadian uh, canadian goose is equally that 800 uh, gb file that I, I was talking about right so had I not uh, casually talked to that uh, support delivery person that day, I, I might have still uh, not known that 800 GB file attachment was was a reality, right? Sometimes, sometimes your worldview is limited by the stuff you are doing in day-to-day -day work, right? But the people who actually uh, work on your software, who actually use it, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis are are the people who know who know the actual uh, actual kind of data the shape and size of data they deal with every day right so that is lesson number one uh, work with work with users actual users if possible if not possible work with people who deal with uh, those users on a day-to-day -day basis to know more about the kind of test data your application is uh, going to consume or generate okay moving on task saturation so uh, even though we remember this uh, incident as uh, something which was successful in the end but if you read the report clearly says that there was a lot of structural damage to the aircraft as well as there was uh, there were some minor injuries and a couple of major injuries to one of the one of the uh, flight attendants also and that could easily uh, have been prevented the thing is that uh, when uh, when the captain and the co-pilot were uh, going down towards the river they were getting two kinds of warnings one was uh, the presence of peril because the flight was very close to the ground um, it should not have been so close at that point so that was one warning the second warning was about the airspeed but uh, that day at that time the terrain warning overrode the airspeed warning. So at no point during that crucial uh, one or two minutes, both the pilots did not get any airspeed warnings. And that meant that they landed at a speed which was faster than the speed they should have landed on, right? And that meant that it was a very hard landing and there was uh, there was a significant damage to the aircraft as well as uh, that impact of the landing caused uh, 
cause injuries to the passengers and the crew. Uh, okay. So how do how do we uh, how do we draw patterns of this situation in in a testing job, right? So what I think is that uh, we have uh, we have test automated test results, right? And and monitors as well, a lot of monitors for multiple applications. We get failures, especially in test automation, right? Uh, flaky results and uh, false positives are very common. You you cannot get away from them uh, as long as you are testing the front end or maybe the end-to-end uh, -end APIs. False positives are are a reality, right? So there are times when you have to make a decision of go or no go for a product in release, and you have a ton of false positives or or something which takes your attention away from the real problem, right? What what we think uh, normally is that multitasking is something which we all do, and you know as managers we put people in multiple projects at the same time, attending multiple stand up meetings and everything to to probably make sure that they are feeling challenged and everything but but uh, at a psychological level multitasking is a myth every time you multitask you context switch between two or more tasks you are actually uh, losing out on your productivity by by ratio of 80% even so the thing is uh, uh, in critical times let's say for a for a release or a flight landing you need your 100% attention on the problem in hand and for that because it's a big decision to go or not go you need right amount of data in your hand to make to make an informed decision right so that is where that is where uh, these false positives uh, from a ton of the test, test suits that you have written can can make you uh, give uh, or maybe make a bad decision right so take care with take care with your tests. Make sure that uh, make sure that the tests that you write are not flaky, right? Even if it is, it is a reality, but uh, make sure that you have prioritized your tests in a way that you're not worried about low priority tests failing versus uh, and that noise concealing behind one particular high priority test that is failing and you don't know about it there because there are uh, 40 other low priority tests that are failing right so that is lesson number two prioritizing things in right order so that uh, when you have to make a decision as a tester you get the right data in your hands from your automated tests or whatever okay moving on to lesson number three, training. So everyone in this world that I've met has a completely different view on training, right? Some people totally despise training as a boring and mundane activity. Some people like training, right? But uh, talking about this flight, both uh, Captain Sully and Captain Skiles had uh, 40,000 years of experience flying planes between them, right? And I was watching this interview of Captain Sully, and he said that uh, since Captain Skiles had recently done an Air Force training, he was able to, you know, go through the checklist and all the procedural things uh, faster than anyone else could have been at that point and that gave captain sully enough time to decide and focus on where to land the plane so there was this you know complementary actions going between them because they they didn't have time to talk to each other and discuss what to do now. and because it was it was that kind of situation so uh, the point i'm trying to make here is that uh, uh, you can you can call it anything, right? If you are trained well enough in your craft, right? Uh, you are well equipped to take those informed decisions in a moment of unforeseen circumstance. That's the point. 
you you cannot always train for unforeseen circumstances because they are by definition unforeseen right even even uh, both the captains in this flight were not trained to do water landing nobody is uh, trained to do water landing in their uh, simulation schools or flight schools but because they were trained uh, in their craft of flying the planes and knowing the aircraft that particular kind of aircraft let's let's call that a context in in testing terms they they did well right so that's the difference i also read this book called uh, hard things about hard things by ben morris and he 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 said one thing which uh, i still remember he said that uh, uh, saying no to trainings because you are busy is just like saying no to food because you are too hungry so that that uh, by that remark i i just uh, want to emphasize the point of training you can you can let's say you train well in your craft and then uh, there is a moment where you need uh, need to make a critical decision you will be better equipped because let's call let's call it expert intuition or let's call it heuristics in testing terms or let's call it muscle memory in in sports and other terms right all these things are developed when you train well in your craft so lesson number 3 is training if you are a tester and you are you're not training yourself in in different situations uh, different uh, in different way, ways of doing testing then probably you're not uh, equipped or capable enough to handle any any situation where you have to make a critical decision of a of a release going ahead or not so lesson number 3 for testers is train as much as you can in terms of testing try to test different kinds of applications and uh, even manually or or writing automated texts uh, however you want but do do it in a more comprehensive way train yourself in a comprehensive way all right by now you know that uh, the major cause of the incident was that the plane engines were tested certified for the birds of smaller size but the birds that hit the plane that they were slightly bigger birds but but did did those birds appear out of nowhere just just like that or uh, were they always crossing uh, the skies at that height at the same time of the day or probably during a particular period of the year what were the migratory patterns of those birds are, are those birds those heavier birds found around your ports majorly due to due to probably an ecosystem of food present there so all these questions right so there are different bodies right there is atc there are pilots there are airport authorities and then there is uh, there are regulatory bodies like dgc and everything who who uh, to develop regulations and everything the point is uh, when you look at software development we also have uh, all these discrete units of wisdom right there are developers who code and then there is project management uh, there might be product management as well there is business analysis and then there is this uh, engineering management and uh, but the one entity that is supposed to look for implicit which in this case is our fourth lesson finding implicit the entity that is supposed to look for implicit in uh, is testers actually right we we are the ones who have to uh, look for those corner cases there is a ton of uh implicit requirements and then there is just a bucket of explicit requirements right so how can we how can we do that okay. first thing is uh, if you are a tester or probably a developer and see our engineering mindset or engineering identity normally takes over our testing uh testing identity right that has to change first so uh, as humans we have this triangle of 
identities, right? For example, if, if you talk about me, I have, let's say, a Red Hatter identity, an Indian identity, uh, a tester identity. But somewhere in between, I also have a problem solver or an engineer identity, right? But if you are a tester, your tester identity at all times should override your problem solving identity or the engineer identity. And how, how can you tell that this is happening when you look at a ticket or a Jira? If you're trying to solve that problem straight away, you look at a Jira as a set of instructions to do something then you can you can know that uh, this is a problem solving or an engineering mindset you are looking but if you look at a jira or a ticket as a placeholder for carrying out further discussion and investigation then you are probably thinking as a tester that obviously that, that would slow you down right you're not straight away going into action there is more deliberation than action but even if it slows you down that's okay. In the end, uh, you don't want to embarrass you and your whole team, right? The point is, look at your Jira tickets, your tasks as placeholders for carrying out further discussions on the same topic. It, and the discussion does not mean that you have to talk to other people. Right? You have to talk to the people. That is for sure. But that also means self-talk and reflection, right? reflection about the problem what kind of problem is it? do i know enough investigation not investing investigating the people but also investigating the software itself right not interrogating the people interacting with the software right? so there are so many things which you can do right you all are testers and you know better than me but the point is never ever look at a jira ticket or a story as a set of instructions that is lesson number four and that is how you find implicit in in this whole story in this whole incident finding the migratory patterns of those big birds canadian geese was the implicit right that that if you look back at this there should have been someone probably an entity a body a government body or anything that must have known that there are bigger birds right and there are bigger birds in the sky in the flight paths and the current certification of jet engines is only up to 2.5 pounds right that does not make any sense but the thing is there never is in this uh, discrete world where each team or each entity is just thinking about their own work there never is such a body which can connect the dots right and that is where in software context testers come into picture and that is why a tester role is so important to software development. All right, I think uh, we are done with our four lessons. I'll just uh, give you a quick recap. The first lesson was yeah, think about whenever you are testing, think about what kind of test data or what kind of data, let's not call it test data, what kind of data your application is going to consume and what kind of data is your application going to generate pay attention to it second thing is uh, prioritizing your tests kill the noise and uh, focus on focus on top information for you to make decisions the third thing is training if you are a tester, test complex applications, test simple app, test in different contexts, and eventually you will become a great tester by just the heuristics part of it. And the fourth one is uh, shunning your problem solving mindset and getting your tester mindset take precedence when you're looking at a problem. Okay, now questions. <laughs> 